number one tonight. We are going to get back into the drama, but not really because we don't really talk about drama here. This whole topic, I just feel like, has been a whole bunch of drama. and Because everyone know, wants to say they said it first. <laughs> right. And you know what's weird is uh, I was... I'm not going to put anyone on blast. I, I won't put anyone. I just won't do that. I won't do that ever for anybody. Uh, it's just not the motto of Thought Riot Podcast. But I was uh, talking with somebody and, uh, you know, I, I had made some comments that this information had been sent to me like a long time ago. And uh, I I don't think people involved in this drama liked the fact that I said that uh, and you know, it, it ended up getting removed and some things like that. That that's my assumption I'm coming to, but uh, I gotta be honest here. I don't, I'll give whoever wants to take credit, go right ahead. I'm not, I'm not interested in credit. I, I will happily never say that I saw it six months ago ever again because it just doesn't matter to me. Um, what matters to me personally is just like progressing the knowledge and science behind it. Um, There's a reason we never claim credit for anything. No, I also don't race for things and I'm not trying to fly my flag of how great am I? You know what I mean? It's just not the goals of the podcast. Not because... Nope. Not because there's something wrong with content creators out there that do want to come out with it first. That's great. Um, but science is not quick a lot of times. Yeah. And I I want to lean on science as much as possible here. So um we just made it a goal right from the beginning that we're not gonna we're not gonna join that race. When the info comes to us and we look into it, then we're gonna look into it, you know, and I'm gonna do it as thorough as possible. And another interesting thing here is everyone that's talked about this, which you guys will probably know what we're talking about already, but every single one of those people are probably going to hate me at the end of this video. That's a strong statement. Yeah, obviously I am. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, <laughs> I think, but okay. I'm going to start it off with the bang statement here. All right. Um, this whole experiment needs to be thrown out the window. All of it. What the experiment? Whole thing, the whole experiment that everyone's leaning on that has to do with the brass button and the sheath. It's flawed. The whole thing, okay? We made a comment, and I want to clarify some things before we actually get into the science of it. What's going on, Thought Riders? So, I realized during editing, I did not make a smooth transition into talking about what this science experiment actually is. So I'm hopping in your video here to explain what it is for our podcast viewers that aren't on the true crime talk show with us. The science experiment we're talking about is uh, titled Trace DNA and its persistence on various surfaces, a long-term study investigating the influence of surface type and environmental conditions, part one, metals. Essentially what it's going through is uh, how DNA uh, breaks down on different metal types. And uh, it, 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 it does a very long-term study uh, of, I think it's like, 10, 7, 8, 10, something different metal types. Uh, but uh, the most important one we're talking about here is going to be brass, right? Because uh, brass is what was involved in the Idaho 4 crime. So back to your show. We started talking about this last night, You're not, uh, last night on the True Crime Talk Show. And I want to give credit where credit's due. The person that's been researching this, and I think that they're on to something. I truly, 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 truly do. But this experiment that everyone's talking about is not going to be the supporting evidence. We're going to have to find a different way because I think it is good evidence to create a, a hypothesis statement, like a hypothesis goal to dig in further. But this, this science experiment doesn't 
have it. And I will walk everyone through it. So last night when we were talking about it, I shouted out Clo Penny and Clo Penny has been talking about this for a long time. They're actually the one who uh, let told us about it like a long time ago. So, um, you know, I can only speak on my experience. And then last night when we were talking about get a clue, I know some people in our chat were like, Hey, you need a shout out, get a clue. And uh, I want to clarify that too here that look, we love get a clue. I feel like we have mm -hmm. a great working relationship with get a clue where he feels comfortable watching our stuff and being like, Hey, you, I don't agree with you guys. You guys are wrong. Uh, and this is why, and we're comfortable watching his content being like, Hey, we don't agree with get a clue. This is why, you know what I mean? And it's done scientifically, it's done objectively and it's done respectfully. And I think that is the, uh, really important point here, right? So I have watched get a clues video now. I think it's really good. I think he takes us through all the important parts of it. Um, I don't know about Get a Clue's background. I have no idea. So obviously this experiment is not Get a Clue's, right? So I, I don't feel like me attacking this experiment is attacking anything Get a Clue has to say. No, I think he will appreciate anything that's objective. Um, yeah. You know, that's what he cares about. Like, I know on the True Crime Talk Show, when we brought this up, I started talking about the um, the button being painted. And I was concerned that could affect um, the ionization of the metal that causes the DNA to degrade um, rapidly. And I wondered if that could affect it. And I have been digging into that as hard as I can. There's very little information, so I've actually reached out to some people on it, um, some people who are in forensics, hoping they will get back to me on that. But because um, I'm curious if there is any study out there that has anything to do with that, um, like literally brass being coated. Yeah, I, I've already reached out to the scientists. So there's three names on this science experiment, but you got to remember the science experiment is from 09. So a long time ago, 15 years ago. Oh, wow. Ago. I didn't realize that. <clears throat> yeah. Sci science usually doesn't get published for a long time after the experiments. But um, and the general public knowing information is even further behind after that. You You're guys. right. You're Literally, right. It is. Uh, it, it's wild how far behind we are on things. Um, but it's true. So, um, OK. I want to dig into this. So shout out to get a clue for covering this topic. Uh, shout out to everyone else that had been covering this. Make a shout out to Clo Penny for uh, digging into all of this and finding all this. All right. And I she, think she confirmed the K bar, the button on the sheaths are made of brass. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which is so, a mixture of copper and zinc and copper is the worst for DNA apparently. Yeah. They actually test brass in here though. Yeah, um, they do. Because brass is a different mixture. So it's alkaloid base and like those things that have to do with the, the degradation of a DNA sample uh, that comes into play with right. it. Um, so going into the actual experiment here, and I've already seen a whole bunch of people questioning the validity of this experiment through ways I don't agree with so far. Like one of them was talking about uh, how this uh, experiment said that there was identifiable DNA still at the end of all of these tests. And that is actually not true. It says very clear in here that the test time stopped as soon as there was not any essentially legible DNA. Once their testing instruments could no longer identify that it was DNA legibly, then uh, that test time stopped there. Okay. Mm, okay. Um, some of these went on for a very, very long time, but I haven't seen anyone talk about this yet and, and get a clue briefly went over it. There's a couple things I want to highlight here, right? Because the whole goal of everyone covering this is that try I want this to be true. Why I want this to be true is because I feel like there are big issues with the DNA sample. There's something to it with the way There's they include Othram, the fact that it is a leading ed edge technology science and we're being told there are no notes, there is no tracking, there is no data. Uh, that is uncommon. That is so 
institutionally uncommon are the institutions that focus on this well, use computer uh, as their work and data source. So that would be in the computers. So being told that there's no work product is a red flag to me. Can I mention something real quick? Also within the interim policy from the DOJ on FGG, which is forensic genetic genealogy, it literally says you don't destroy all of this information until like it's not needed anymore or until there's a conviction. They're not supposed to, they are supposed to destroy it, but there's certain criteria to destroying it. Like they destroyed it too quickly. If they destroyed all of it, mm -hmm. I'm questioning if it was destroyed because what did they give over to Anne then? Yeah. 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 I wonder if that was a lie or like, you know, Bill Thompson didn't know. Yeah. He was told that, but it wasn't true. Yeah. Kind of thing. Look, I'm right there with you. And and for okay, so the rundown on the science experiment before I start pulling out my red flags here, right? And I want <clears throat> if anyone's an expert in this, I am not an expert in this topic. Okay. So call me out on it, please. You know, I, I'm not ever promising to be right. Uh I'm promising to research science and science is ever evolving. So I'm going to be wrong more than I'm right here. Um, but what this experiment did is they took, uh, essentially, I'm going to keep it as vague as possible. They took trace DNA samples. They put those trace DNA samples onto metal to see how quickly uh, or how how prolonged uh, the metal surface would degrade the DNA sample. Yeah, many different types of metal, right? Many different types of metal. We can get into the details of it, but we're highlighting one specific type of metal, right? Because uh, we've been told through the investigation in the Idaho 4 that there was a knife sheath left on the scene of the crime. And that knife sheath was a K-bar knife sheath. The K-bar knife sheath has a brass button. That brass button had uh, DNA in or around it of Brian Koberger's, right? Well, uh, Chloe Penny had been, has been talking about this for a very, 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 very long time saying, hey, something's not right here. Look into this, you guys. And she and, contacted K-Bar and confirmed that yep. all their knife sheets are made with brass buttons. Yep, contacted K-Bar and, and got all that done and everything. Um, yeah. And then found this science experiment, which um, I think... Chloe Penny had been frustrated that no one picked up the story, but uh, science goes a long way to back a statement, right? And and I'm guilty of that too, where I was just talking about this a minute ago, that the way that I look at things is I take everything that's said from people as false until proven true, right? Um, so the study is what the study makes is you what, interested exactly and you know what's really strange is i st is when she posted it i started looking into it but like literally at the same time that all the drama started happening because i didn't even see any content i was just like oh this is amazing i totally remember hearing about this, i know because you, you know? brought it up before that video was ever made and yep. it was you said on reddit yep and i was like and then i saw that video the next day and i was like oh Yep. So this is a big conversation going around. It is. It is. It is. All right. So um, they tested all of these DNAs um, in the uh, in different settings. They did it in a dark setting. They did it in a light setting and they put uh, DNA on these metal surfaces to check how long they last. Now, brass came up with a very very interesting outcome. Uh, it, it lasted no longer than a 24 hour period. Um, I thought it was 12 hours. No, when you, when you look at it, we can pull it up real quick here. Um, so experimental time points. And then what does that mean? 
Uh, minimum was 14.85. Maximum was 20.82. Uh, now, when you go down to brass, uh, it is 412 to 12. Uh, that is the cellular mixture. Uh, Table five is time after which DNA became undetectable. And what's interesting when you go down here, hang on. The persistence data for brass is presented in figure 10 from time zero to 24 hours on a linear scale. The DNA did not persist in any form for longer than 24 hours on this metal. Okay, but is... In any form for longer than 24 hours on this metal. As you can see here, uh, it says uh, when a solution containing only CFDNA, which for those of you, CFDNA is cell-free DNA, uh, and it's found in like biofluid or it's free of biofluids and its cellular origins. Um, so when when a solution containing only CFDNA was deposited on brass after one hour, samples stored in a dark produced a DNA recovery of 84%. In contrast, when CFDNA sample, samples were stored under normal or humid, humid conditions, the ability of the DNA to persist after one hour was reduced and recovery fell below 16%. The ability to recover DNA deposit, deposited alone decreased rapidly and after four hours became completely undetectable when stored in any environmental condition. Unsurprisingly, samples stored in the dark and normal environments persisted longer at higher amounts than those stored in humid conditions. So why I'm not digging into like the nitty gritty here, I understand people have focused on that four hour mark, but I'm going back to what I was saying. This whole test is flawed. Everything about it is flawed. Now I'll, I'll get to that point. But so we're we're on a consensus here, right? That none of the tests la lasted longer than a 24 hour period, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So going back to what I was originally saying, the uh, the sample DNA. This is really important. Really, really important. I think a lot of people miss this. Okay. So. The cell-free component used cell-free component used for this study came from rainbow trout, which were donated by a local fisherman. The trout's livers were removed and the DNA was extracted, and then using a standard phenyl uh, chloroform protocol uh, and a machine. I forget what that machine's called. I think it's electrophoresis. Uh, the extracted DNA was stored and frozen until required. They stored it in a liquid uh, and, and extracted the DNA, sonicated for 30 minutes in order to reduce the molecular weight, making it more representative of CFDNA. Okay, so we got that coming from trout DNA. They are manipulating that the DNA that they're using to make it more like CFDNA coming from a, a bio liver from the trout. Got it? Okay. Okay. Um, so then we're going to look at the mouse embryonic fibroblasts were donated to this project uh, by the School of Life Sciences at the University of Dundee. Calls cells were removed from the tissue culture flask by uh, trypsin and it trypsin is uh and washed three times with phosphate buffered saline um cell concentrated was determined by staining with four six dia diamedino uh i'm not even gonna try uh i'm gonna, i'm just gonna hack that all up cells were then resuspended at a concentration of uh one by ten six uh 20 percent glycerol phosphate buffered saline okay so everyone got that, right? I guess. Okay. So you got it enough to understand that they had to make adjustments to the DNA at a cellular level in order to make it more representative of the testing samples that they wanted to conduct, right? Okay. So next they use synthetic fingerprint 
solution, synthetic fingerprint solution, okay? Uh, and remember, I want this test to be valid and be able to be argued in court, you guys. The synthetic fingerprint solution was created following a procedure described by Cisco et al. with some alterations as highlighted, with some alterations as highlighted. A synthetic, uh, accurate whatever solution and a synthetic sebum solution were made sebum, separately. that's your skin oil yeah uh solution were made separately and mixed to create a synthetic emulsion which was subsequently diluted to create a synthetic fingerprint solution then it goes in here to break down exactly what that fingerprint solution was it gives you the five inorganic salts amino acids other uh, components, and then it tells you what they did by running it through a filter vacuum filtration unit to reduce the serum, change the composition, and uh, be able to make it be able to make it bind with the fatty acids needed. Okay, so everyone understands here that this test is being used as a representation to uh, say that human trace DNA is not usable and can't hold up in a court of law because this testing says so. Hmm? That That's the argument, right? That the DNA cannot hold well, up in a court of law. Specifically in this case because of the metal. Because therefore it can't, withhold within you know four hour to 24 hour period however every single sample they're using in this testing is not human or fake it's man-made so when you're looking at it from the point of view of a court system a court will not accept this there is no uh evidence that can be gained from this testing that will relate to a human trace DNA. Now, Get a Clue went over this, and he went over the, the salmon portion or whatever and was like, that's not a big deal. DNA is DNA. It's not, unfortunately. So in here, it talks about the pH balance of the solution and the DNA that they're running, okay? So they're running it at a standard 5.5 pH balance. Do you know what a human is? What? A human is 7.5, or depending on uh, the upper body versus the lower body, it could be as high as 8, which totally changes the the, the composition and uh, acidic nature of what you're using as a test sample. The pH balance is going to react differently on each of these metals dealing with an alkaloid. So I go back to trying to understand how this is evidence that this can't be true. I think this is an awesome starting point, like great starting point. This will never, ever, ever get brought up in court. Never, never. There is no scientist that would be able to come into court and say, for sure, court, I can tell you without a doubt that the trace DNA that was left on that brass button that was human DNA, that was Brian Koberger's DNA, couldn't have lasted long, longer than four hours on that brass button because let me show you how relatable it is to uh, trout DNA. With fake solution, using and recreating, recreating a fingerprint uh, solution that is inorganic, completely man-made. It's just not going to happen. It is not going to happen, right? And and one of the things I was worried about bringing this up, right? Because uh, again, like I said, so many people talked about this, and I think this is a great starting point. But we're not being true to ourselves at Thought Riot Podcast if we're not scrutinizing everything, scrutinizing everything. Okay, we are completely unbiased. Would I love this to be? The, the reason why the DNA is so shoddy in this case, would I love to be able to prove that 
without a doubt, there was no human DNA left on there. I would love it because I think something's wrong here. But this does not tell us that. So, so what this, I think, this study tells us is that there absolutely is an issue with brass and DNA. So if it's as they said, and it was found on this button, there are major questions there, but we need, we need a study using human DNA. We need a study using human DNA. To see what the actual Correct. viability times are. Like at what point? Not just that, but also because court has a very high relatability factor, okay? And a lot of people that, a lot of experts lose that in court where your argument, you can have an argument that's less true than another expert. And if you're relatable, in that argument, then your argument is going to have a bigger impact on that case. Unfortunately, I think if you put this in front of any skilled attorney, they're going to rip it apart. They're going to make it sound like, so how can you tell me, Mr. Expert, with confidence that uh, you can take trout DNA and, and, and it's going to do the same exact thing as uh, human DNA, fingerprint DNA with all the oils, with all the other things that are involved uh, on a fingerprint, right? Um, and not only that, but include it into your man-made solution that is supposed to replicate finger oils uh, to be thrown on this test and then effectively prove that uh, that the human sample would degrade. I it's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. And and let me let me talk on this part too because this is really important. So as you guys so I don't most of you probably know by now that I have a bachelor of science. So not science like this. I was never in a lab doing like testing on biology or chemistry or anything like that. But, uh, uh, science, science, uh, discussions, materials, hypotheses, uh, tests, and the conclusion of those all write up the same. They all write up exactly the same. All right. And at the end of any test, there's always a either general considerations in this situation or like honor honorable mentions honorary mentions for the test itself so these are variables that should be taken into account and and the reader needs to understand that these variables could have you know it, it could have a variation on the outcome of the testing here okay so 4.2, in this work, we have attempted to evaluate the effect of metal surfaces on the persistence of cellular and DNA exposed to three different environmental conditions. However, it is important that to highlight that the altering that altering the variables used within the experiment could influence the observed results. For example, changing the DNA collection method in this work we used a single cotton swab moistened with EB buffer to collect all DNA samples. In practice, there are many swab types available in conjunction with different swabbing techniques, uh, any combination of which may influence recovery efficiency. Additionally, alternative to swabbing, tape lifting is also commonly used for DNA collection and can be assumed to influence recovery efficiency in a different way had it been employed in this study. Another variable that would likely influence the observed results is, is if changed would be altering the method of DNA uh, deposition. It can be assumed that changing the mode of the DNA uh, deposition from gentle pipetting to smearing, spraying, or dropping from a varied height in conjunction with the varying the volume or total DNA of deposits would also have an effect on the results and would be worthwhile area to investigate. In a recent paper by Hughes, uh, attention was drawn to the effect texture of a non-porous surface could have on the recovery of biological samples in addition to the adherence of such samples on a surface. They highlight that surface tension and hydrophobicity 
of a deposit can drive the adhesion of deposits to a surface along with the surface roughness, thus indicating that changing the deposit volume or sample makeup could influence the sample's interaction with the metal surface and influence persistence. Additionally, this probably has some relevance where the deposited material has a corrosive effect. Remember that pH, you guys. The, the pH balance used here was manipulated to a 5.5, whereas a human's is 7.5 and could be as high as 8. Okay. However, given the size of the current persistence, project and the number of samples involved in this study using the defined experimental procedure, it was impractical to test or monitor changing the variables. And it even goes so far in here to, uh, to say that the reason why we did the DNA in this way, because in order for us to use human DNA, we would have had to get swab kits. Those swab kits would have been wildly ineffective in price, and we wouldn't have been able to run this test using those. Yeah. So we need to start a GoFundMe to have our own study done? Yeah. So womp, womp, <laughs> womp on this test, at least. There yeah. is nothing here. And I wish there I, was. I don't agree that there's nothing here. I think it it proves that this deserves a further look into seeing uh, how long a human's DNA could survive in that environment. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I just mean that the, this made no progress in the starting point from a uh, criminal investigative uh, point of view, from a criminal, uh, from a criminal investigative angle. This doesn't add value to anything that you would find in a crime scene. I reached out to the scientists involved, and like I said, this test was 15 years ago. Um, and I put a whole bunch of questions together <clears throat> asking them, what, what was the monetary difference in using the human testing versus this testing here? Because in my opinion, uh, I would think that creating uh, a man-made solution it renders your argument like ineligible in this case because they're talking specifically about trace DNA. And one of the people involved here is actually part of a police force um, in a different area in the world. Uh, but this, this test can't be used. Like it cannot effectively be used because the amount of changing variables in this test it put adds too much separation from human DNA, whether you're talking about the pH, which is a massive deal. I don't know why they used 5.5. The only reason that I could think is because a pH of 5.5 is known for being the most, the most reliable and easy to handle. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's like the base level, right? In the middle. It, yeah. It's, Absolutely right in the middle. Correct. So, so it's not too alkaloid or too acidic, but if that's, but that changes everything it, yeah, in the test. If you're looking at human DNA, like clear, Correct. that is acidic, it, that clearly matters. Using human DNA, I just want to be clear here, using t human DNA in a test like this, like in the increased pH, it could cause quicker deterioration. The correct pH? Yeah. Oh. It could. I mean, theoretically, right? And where we need to look at this from is this is all theoretical. This is all theoretical. Okay. The whole thing is theoretical in uh, when you're looking at it from a human DNA point of view. So, yeah, I would love a scientist to... Uh, to use human examples, you know, we, we saw trace DNA science tests that were done and maybe the 15 years has made it cheaper, but they did the test on the transfer of trace DNA on, um, a knife handle. You know what I mean? Hmm. 
So yeah, the yeah the, yeah we saw that one. We talked yep. about it, right? This one did. we did talk about with transferring and like how some people had like more of the other person's DNA than their own. Yep. Like when they touched it. Yep. Yeah, all that stuff. That was a really interesting study. Super it, interesting. It was, and it makes you seriously question the validity of touch DNA. It. it it just has to remain circumstantial evidence. Like while it's a big deal to find touch DNA at a crime scene and it can be a huge lead for investigators, you just don't know how it got there. I and that totally matters. Agree. That matters. Yep. Totally. But I'm agree questioning with you. I'm quite in the Koberger case, Idaho 4 case, I'm questioning the validity of that knife sheath and what they collected from it. Um, and I think a lot of people are because it seems so strange. Yeah. Yeah. I, I personally think, look, if you're going to do a test like this and, and you're going to connect it, uh, with criminal investigations in some way, um, why wouldn't you use live human samples? Yeah. I just don't get it. Ask a human being to touch that metal surface and then, uh, now that we have the the testing that we have at at, at such a uh, microscopic level, you know, like literally where we're pulling DNA out of the air now, um, I would think that this test is outdated and old, and we should be able to increase the effectiveness of these tests now, and it should be even cheaper. Yeah. I agree. I think there's ways to make, do this and it'd be cheaper. Yep. But let me know what you guys think. I think I probably went uh, a little bit longer there than I planned, but it's interesting. And I think these topics are really important. And uh, I just want to give another shout out to Clopenny. This is an awesome, awesome, awesome find. And I hope that, you know, me just being critical, right. And, and scrutinizing every single thing that we touch uh, is, uh, you know, not looked at as a negative thing because science. We the just best need to go find a better study. Yeah. The best scientists are the ones that scrutinize everything, right? Don't accept nothing. Be a uh, contrarian to, you know, as deeply as you can be in any topic that you can be big, all the questions of why, how, who, you know? Yeah. So, but anyways. Interesting for sure. Let us know. Let us know what? What you think. Okay. <laughs>